I want to talk about Easter for a second. Uh, for the past five year, or few years, at Easter and Christmas, we've handed out gift cards uh, to Starbucks and stacks of invite cards, and we've encouraged people to take them home and invite people to collective. The idea is that you buy them Starbucks or you pass on the gift card and say, hey, I, I want you to come to church with me this Easter because I think you will love it. And we know this makes a lot of people nervous. It makes me nervous inviting people to church. Uh, inviting people to church is a pretty vulnerable thing because what if they say no and you feel rejected? Uh, or what if they say yes and you get your hopes up but they don't actually show up? Uh, but the reason we keep doing this is because I never want us as a church to buy into the lie that invitation doesn't matter, because it does. When Ray and I realized that God was pushing us to plant a church, we felt like we could plant anywhere. We were actually encouraged to stick around Cleveland, Ohio, um, but we both hated Ohio um, because it's gray 200 days a year, because of the Browns, just because of everything else. So we decided that's not going to be the place for us. And we actually talked about moving to maybe one of the cities that were growing in North Carolina, but after living in the South for six years, I couldn't handle people driving 50 and a 55 for the rest of my life, so I wasn't interested in that. Uh, we even talked about Hawaii, and this was Ray's idea, and she wanted this one <laughs> really bad. Uh, I kept telling her the cost of living was way too high, but she would just rebuttal with, but pineapples are so cheap, uh, which for me is a pretty strong argument because I think pineapples are the best fruit of all time. But ultimately, I kept feeling this burden to come back home to the D.C. area, uh, partly because this region is brutal when it comes to church planting, and most churches don't survive. But also, because I had this really great opportunity growing up to invite my friends to church, but I never did it because I was too scared. One of the biggest regrets I have in my Christian faith is not inviting some of my high school friends to church. I went to a great church. I found Jesus in that church. I was not embarrassed about going to that church. I loved it. I just never invited anyone. The summer after my freshman year of college, I was back home for a few weeks, and I got together with a group of guys that I grew up with, and they knew I was going to a Christian college, but they had no idea that I was going into ministry. Um, this was actually all like pre-Facebook era, um, and when texting was still T9 and cost 10 cents to send and receive, so I was like, I'm not going to talk to them about this. I'd have to call them. Like, I wasn't going to do that. And so we got together, we grabbed lunch, and I shared with them that I changed my major from marketing to ministry because I felt like God was calling me to plant a church. And they didn't have much to say about it because they weren't church people. But at the end of the night, my friend Danny came up to me and he said, I had no idea that you were that into church. And they said, you know, I would have gone with you if you had asked. And the truth is, I've carried that with me for 15 years. And so here's the thing. I know that you think your invitation doesn't matter, but it does. And they might not say yes. They might not say yes right now. They might not say yes later this summer when you invite them to grocery store buyout or our fifth birthday in the fall or Christmas Eve this winter. You might keep inviting them, and they might keep saying no. But what if they don't? What if they show up? Or what if years from now they're going through something hard in their life, something they didn't plan for, and they find themselves in a place where they don't know what to do, but they remember you sharing with them about a church that you love and about how God is doing things in your marriage? or your mental health, or your self-worth that you never imagined possible. And maybe they walk in these doors. And so my encouragement for all of us, including myself, is to not let fear or worry get in the way of you reaching out to a few people over the next few weeks and saying, hey, I go to this church I love, and I think you will love it too. Do you want to join me for Easter? Will you sit with me this Easter? It took my family over two years to say yes to going to church with our neighbors. And I'm so thankful that they didn't give up on us because my life has changed forever. And if you think about it, Collective wouldn't actually exist if they had given up. And so grab some invite cards, grab some Starbucks, and be bold. Reach out to a few people and invite them because the worst thing that could happen is that they say no, and that stings a little, but the best thing that could happen is they show up and their lives are never the same. So here's what I want to do today before we get into the sermon. Um, I actually want to pray for us as a church and for these invite cards and really for the people who might be receiving those over the next few weeks. So let's pray together. Uh, God, I just pray as we, we head toward Easter, we head toward um, one of the easiest times for us to, to tell people, hey, come and see uh, what Jesus is doing in my life. Will, will you come sit with me? Um, God, I pray as we move into that, that space in those weeks leading up to it, God, that, that we have boldness. Um, God, that we don't let fear get in the way of inviting somebody to experience you in a way that has impacted us, in a way that we want uh, 
to impact them as well. And God, um, I just pray that today there are people in our hearts and, and people we've uh, been nervous uh, to invite. God, I pray that they woke up today realizing that something was missing from their lives, longing for something else. Um, God, that they're searching for something else and, and, and ultimately we show up saying, hey, we think we know what will help us out. We think we know the answer and it's, it's Jesus. And so, God, give us the boldness to do that. Um, God, give us the grit uh, to not give up when they say no, um, the compassion to keep inviting and praying. Um, God, ultimately, uh, help us be people and help us be a church that, that changed this city, this county, that changed Maryland, um, because, uh, because you are getting more in, involved in people's lives. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in this church. We love you and praise your name. Amen. So last week, we started this new series where we are looking at some of the lies we believe that are having a negative impact on our faith. And we kind of have two theme verses for this. The first one's in John 8. It says this, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then a little bit later, Jesus says this in John 17, make them holy by your truth, teach them your word, which is truth. So another way of saying this would be that God's words set us free. And as a church, one of our core values is that we are rooted in truth. This means that we trust in Scripture because we believe that it leads to the best life possible. We want our foundation to be God's Word. And I understand that not every person here would say that they're rooted in truth, and that's okay. A collective is a place where you can belong before you believe. And there are people here that believe but will still wrestle with some of what the Bible teaches. Right? They believe, like we talked about last week, but they also have doubts. But from time to time, I'll get an email or have a conversation with someone in the lobby, and they'll ask me, hey, what does collective think, or where does collective stand when it comes to fill-in-the-blank topic? And if you and I have had this conversation before, you know how it goes, I will respond by saying, collective teaches what the Bible teaches. It is not about my opinion. It's not about one church leader who said that one thing that one time. It's not about denominational traditions. We're non-denominational. We have no traditions. Uh, it's not about what culture thinks. It's about God's word. And so we're going to teach God's word because we believe it is truth. And so the best way to know what we teach or, or what I will teach from stage here at Collective is to read your Bible. Now, if you're reading and you get caught up on something or something doesn't make sense, which will happen, right? If you read your Bible, there will be things and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. Or we do something at Collective that you don't understand or want to learn more about. I would love to have that conversation with you. Because it says to me that you are reading your Bible and you are owning your growth. And I'd love, love, love to help you with that. And so collective is rooted in truth. And Jesus says that that truth will set us free. And that's ultimately what we want, right? Like we want to feel free. But one of the things that get in the way of that freedom are these lies that have crept into our faith and planted themselves as truth. My wife is a really big plant person. Um, and so while I don't know much about gardening, I do know that the plants in my house seem to be multiplying. Um, in fact, I didn't really realize this. I was working on this message and looked around our living room. But the plants that she has have grown all over the place, and they're like wrapping themselves around things in our living room. Like they're covering a bookshelf. They're like going up around this like shelf thing we have. Eventually, it's going like to suck up my children, I think, like take them away. Um, here's my hot take for today. I think plants are the new cats for millennial women. Uh, eventually, you're going to start seeing like people taking pictures of their plants, or their plants having Instagrams, I guess. I don't really know. Um, but last summer, Ray was in our front yard, and she noticed there's this new plant that had these really beautiful white flowers, and it sprung up, and it was kind of getting intertwined with all of our other plants. And so she pulled up her plant identification app, which is a real thing, and learned that it was called a wild morning glory, or field bindweed. And while it looks like a flower, it's an invasive weed that climbs up other plants and eventually chokes them out. Uh, it will actually and can kill, it will outcompete and kill up to 60% of your garden and your crops. It can take about 20 years just to eradicate it if you find it. And it reminds me of the lie that we're talking about today. This is a lie that looks good on the outside. It presents itself as this beautiful part of our life, but it's slowly choking out our faith. And the lie is that God's way is harder. That living a life rooted in truth, that following God's teaching, that trusting God when it comes to things like our relationships or our money or our marriage is harder. And that belief stops us from living the life God has designed for us. Check out what Jesus says in Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. It says this, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. 
So this is an open invitation for everyone, for the lost, for the broken, the rejected, the skeptical, for people who think their way of doing life is better. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Then he says this in verse 29, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is using farming imagery here. Oxen would be paired up with a yoke and be put on both of them so they could walk side by side while plowing fields. So they work together. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, I will teach you a better way to live and I will walk alongside you as you figure it all out. Right? We're going to go side by side as you work through this stuff. And this is how we find rest, by having this relationship with God and walking alongside him. And then Jesus finishes with this in verse 30. He says, For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And burden just meaning the things that Jesus asks us to carry. The burden is the way that he calls us to live. And so Jesus promises us that living God's way means that we will have rest for our souls. Now, I do want to make sure I say this, though. Jesus is not saying that following him makes everything easy. Jesus is not saying that following him takes away all the hard things in our lives. Christians are not promised a life eliminated of pain or illness or disaster, but they are promised that in those hard times, they are able to experience God's sustaining grace so that we're not crushed or driven to despair. So what Jesus is saying is that when we choose to follow God's way, we will experience rest for our souls that his burden is lighter than the burden we put on ourselves or than the burdens that the world puts on us. And so the lie is that God's way is harder. But here's the first part of the truth for today. Change is hard. It's not that God's way is harder. It's that changing is hard. Growth is hard. Becoming the person God calls us to be is hard. Right? We're so accustomed to living this life the way that we're currently living it, to living outside of what God wants for us, to living outside of alignment with him, that listening to his teaching and walking alongside him is hard. Right? Change is hard. About 10 years ago, I was at a barbecue, and a friend of mine threw a football just a few feet above my head, and so I reached up to grab it, and when my arm got to about 90 degrees, I felt this excruciating pain in my shoulder, like fall on the ground. I was in the fetal position, like rocking back and forth pain. And I'd had shoulder pain in my right arm for years, but I just kind of dealt with it. But this is the worst it had ever been. And so I went to a physical therapist to see what was going on. They referred me to a specialist so I could do something that's called an arthrogram. And so ultimately, the arthrogram, what they do is they inject dye into your joints and they do an MRI to figure out like what is going on with your body. And what they found in my shoulder was that I had scar tissue everywhere because I'd actually torn my rotator cuff in high school. And I remember shoulder pain uh, while playing baseball, but I never thought it was that big of a deal, but it was. Apparently, because I didn't take care of it correctly, the muscles and tendons in my shoulder had actually healed incorrectly. Uh, In fact, there was so much pain that I would like curl my shoulder in and it healed this way, so I constantly had one shoulder moved in. And so, going to the physical therapist, they told me I needed to go three times a week for over a year. And what they do is I would go and they put these pads on my shoulders and shocks through my body, through my arm. And then what they would do is they'd take this really hard die cast, it looked like a spoon, essentially, and they would grind it into my skin to break up the scar tissue. And when I'd come home, my chest and my arm and my back would be covered in bruises. And it was hard, and it hurt. But the truth is, now I can lift my arm above my shoulder, and I couldn't do that for a very long time. And that's kind of what it's like to live a life where we go from not living in Christ to living in Christ. We go from a place where our arms will only go so high and we think this is normal. We think that the pain is normal. We think that the tension is normal. We think that the brokenness and hurt is normal. But then Jesus comes into our life and says, I can teach you a better way. I can give you something better. And so we have to break some habits. We have to break the way we think. We have to break our understanding of good and rest and freedom. And that is hard. God's way is different than how we want to live our lives. God's truth when it comes to things like sex and money and friendships and our emotions and our time seems harder because we don't actually want to change, and change is hard. That's why when we read the Bible, we read stories about people like the rich young ruler, 
This guy wants to follow Jesus, and Jesus says to him, hey, there's one big thing standing in the way. You love your money and your possessions and your status more than me. And so Jesus says, get rid of those things and then come follow me. And in Matthew 19, it says that he walks away sad. It's because he didn't want to change. He would rather be sad and the same person than happy and different. But let's take this a step further. The lie is that living God's way is harder, and the truth is that change is hard. But here's the second part of this. And living our own way is harder. Right? When we say that God's way is too hard, what we're really saying is that we think our way is better, that, the thing, that we think the way we're living our life right now is easier, that it's better for us, but it's just not true. God's way is always going to be better than the way that we choose for ourselves. Let's look at a few examples for this. First one's in Acts 20, verse 35. It says this, You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than receive. And so Jesus says, you will be happier if you're generous. And, and a lot of times we talk about this when it comes to money. It's just talking about generosity in general. Like, are you a giving type person? But this is Jesus' teaching. But science and psychology back this up. Studies have shown that older people who are more generous have a better life. Research has also shown that spending money on others can be as effective as, at lowering blood pressure as medication or exercise. They've also found that there's a positive association between helping others and life expectancy. Right? You will live a longer life if you are generous. But being generous is hard, right? Because the truth is, we're selfish. Like, we want things for ourselves more than we want for other people. When it comes to our money, we have bad spending habits or debt or money controls us instead of us controlling our money. And so God's way isn't harder. Our way is harder. God's way is better. It has more of an impact and more of a future. God's way is also not about us, but about other people as well. Here's another one. Let's talk about sex. This is probably the topic we don't like the most when it comes to God. Here's what Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 7. It says, but because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Right? And so God's way is that sex is good and you should have it inside of the boundaries of a marriage between a husband and a wife. And that seems harder and so we choose other ways. We choose hooking up. We choose open relationships. We choose stepping out on our spouse to fulfill our sexual desires. We choose pornography, all of it. But if God's way is harder, why is it that divorce is higher in marriages that have sex outside of marriage? Why is it that divorce rates double for men and triple for women when pornography is consumed in marriage? Or how about this? Studies have shown that increasing numbers of sex partners were associated in increasing risk of substance abuse. Dr. Deirdre Fitzgerald from Eastern Connecticut did a study, and she found that promiscuity is considered a high-risk behavior. It's comparable to behaviors like heavy drinking, drug addiction, pornography addiction. Right? And this is just data. Right? You're not arguing with Jesus when you argue with these. You're arguing with science and sociology and psychology. So which way is harder, God's way or our own way? Which way is harder on our marriage? Which way is harder on our mental, emotional, and physical health? When our way destroys our marriage, which way is harder on our kids? I mean, this doesn't mean that divorce doesn't happen in marriages where God is at the center. It does. My point is that, that if we had to choose which way is better, God's way or our own way, we would know which way is better, even if we don't trust God's word, because science and psychology and sociology back that up. Just a few more. Scripture tells us that God created us to be in community, that living life solo leads to a life that's meaningless. Genesis 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. Now, is it hard to put ourselves out there? Yes. Is it scary to open up and be vulnerable, meet new people, allow relationships to go beyond the surface? Of course it is. Do we as people have trust issues and often struggle to allow other people into our lives to care about us? Absolutely. But studies tell us that loneliness has been associated with premature death, that loneliness is commonly correlated with mental health issues such as anxiety and depression and suicide, that loneliness needs to poor coping mechanisms such as compulsive technology use or smoking or even self-harm. They've even found that loneliness is likened to smoking 15 cigarettes a day when it comes to our health. It's that detrimental. It is hard to be in community. It is hard to be real in the relationships we have. But life is harder 
when we choose to be alone. Let's talk about forgiveness. Scripture tells us in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God's way is to forgive and let go. We've talked about this before. Unforgiveness is like holding on and clenching our fists, but forgiveness is releasing that. So God says, hey, we should forgive the way we've been forgiven, but our way is to hold on and allow our unforgiveness to dictate who we are. But guess what research shows? And this is from the Cancer uh, Treatment Centers of America. People who forgive are more likely to have higher self-esteem, lower blood pressure, fewer stress-related health issues, better immune system function, and lower rates of heart disease, among other health benefits. One more. Let's talk about the most viral moment from this week, the slap heard around the world, Will Smith versus Chris Rock. Like, that, that's a troubling moment, right? I think we would all agree with that. But do you know what bothered me the most? I'm a huge Will Smith fan. But what bothered me the most is that Will Smith later got on stage and said, I am overwhelmed by what God is calling on me to be and do in this world. But guess what? He wasn't choosing God's way. He was choosing his own way in that moment. Right? Here's God's way when dealing with our enemies. Matthew 5, this is from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, you've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Right? That's the reality of what happened. But Jesus says, but I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Right? Chris Rock kind of did that. That's not really what he's intending to do. Uh, but a few verses later, Jesus also says this in, 40, in verse 44. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? That, that's God's way. That's what God wants for us when it comes to people who have hurt us and people who we would consider an enemy. And I could keep going. Anxiety is lower for people who read their Bible regularly. Mental health is better for people who attend church on Sundays. And people who follow Jesus, suicide is lower. Alcohol and drug abuse is lower. Self-destructive thinking is lower. Self-worth is higher. And so here's my point. Jesus says that God's word sets us free. And when we read the Bible, we read things that we don't always like, and sometimes we feel like it's hard. But God cares about how we treat others. God cares about what we do with our time and our money. God cares about our sex life and our sexuality. He cares about our hearts and whether we harbor unforgiveness. He cares about our character. And because of all of that, he teaches us a better way to live. God's way isn't harder. Our way is. Our way is harder on our marriages. It's harder on our mental health. It's harder on our friendships. It's harder on our self-worth. And that life is so much harder because we lack the things that God says we need, like community. We lack generosity, we lack hope, and we lack grace, and we lack peace. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we want to live a weary life, a burdened life, a heavy life, or do we want to have rest for our souls? Let me ask it like this, and I really, really want to challenge you to wrestle with this today and this week. Let me ask you. What is the cost, right? What's the cost of doing things God's way? What's the cost of trusting God's word? What's stopping you from truly leaning in and allowing God's truth to bring you freedom, right? What do you lose if you choose God's way over your own? What is the cost? And I'll just talk about myself for a moment. So I have abandonment uh, and self-worth issues, and I've had them for a very long time. They have a huge impact on my life, right? They impact everything I do. It impacts how I lead, how I handle conflict, um, how I'm married to my wife. It impacts how I'm parenting. It impacts my friendships. And, And all this stems from years and years and years of pain. But the reality is that it comes from unforgiveness. Because the truth is, I would rather hold on to a grudge than let it go. And that is sin. Right? That is sin. That is a sin I deal with on a regular basis. God's way is forgiveness. But my own way is unforgiveness. It's protecting myself. It's making sure I put up walls so I don't get hurt again. And I know, I know that God's way is better because I've seen it. Right? I've seen what God's forgiveness does in my own life. I've seen what forgiveness does in other people's lives and in their marriages and in their relationships. I know the freedom that comes with forgiving people who've hurt you and moving toward peace. I've seen that. I know but change is hard. And here's the thing. If I choose God's way, guess what? The cost is that I can't play the victim anymore. I can't allow my past pain to dictate how I treat people currently. I can't make excuses 
for my lack of vulnerability with my friend. If I forgive the people who have hurt me, I have to grow and go face to face with my brokenness. And I'm not really sure I want to do that because that sounds hard. That sounds difficult. That sounds like something that won't just go away because change is hard. Right? I am more comfortable in my pain than I am pursuing God's way. So let me ask you again, what is the cost? What do you actually lose if you choose God's way over yours? Last fall, I met a guy named Sean who has quickly become a really good friend of mine. And we were both at this retreat. He had a seat open next to him, so I sat down. And over the course of the weekend, we started talking about how we ended up at this retreat. And he shared with me that just about a year earlier, he had hit absolute rock bottom. Sean was in his mid-20s. He was an alcoholic, a borderline drug addict, and he spent most of his weekends hooking up with people that he met on Tinder. He also shared that he had self-worth issues, struggled with anxiety and depression, and for months had been considering suicide. One morning, he woke up on a stranger's floor with no memory of how he got there. And it also happened to be a Sunday where he was supposed to be serving at his church that day. Wearing the same clothes that he'd been wearing for what he thought was a few days, he got in his car and he started driving to church. And the whole way there, he was just sobbing. As he puts it, he didn't even know who he was anymore. That morning he got to church late, so his team leader told him to just go worship, go sit into service. And he later admitted that he thought he was doing a much better job at hiding all of his issues, but he learned that it was really obvious but it was just that the people in his church kept loving him and showing him grace when he screwed up and giving him truth when he started to walk away from God. And he told me that he doesn't even remember what the pastor was preaching on that Sunday um, because he wasn't actually listening to the sermon, but he made a deal with himself that day that he was going to get sober. And the next year of his life was brutal. He failed a lot. He tried really hard. He kept falling short. But eventually it worked. I was lucky enough to meet a healed version of Sean, and uh, you wouldn't even know he'd gone through all these things because he is one of the most compassionate, most thoughtful, most God-loving people I have ever met in my life. Eventually, he moved out of state. He moved south. Now he leads in a church, uh, and he helps other men fight for sobriety and purity and self-worth. He came to God weary and carrying these heavy burdens because he'd been choosing to do his life his own way for the majority of his teenage and adult years. But now he knows who he is and who God wants him to be. He has friendships, like real friendships that go beyond just talking about the weather. And he is real about his brokenness and what God is doing in his life. And that is actually changing other people's lives as well. And so listen, here's the action for today. Because we don't want to just talk about things, we want to do them. And so here's the challenge for this week, the, the takeaway. Spend time this week trusting God's way and see how it impacts your life. Right? Give it a shot. Right? Some of you are skeptical, you're doubtful, that's okay. We talked about this last week, though. Lean in. Pick up your Bible and start reading. Start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Read about who Jesus is, what he does for other people. Right? Start serving others. Pursue forgiveness in the relationships that are broken. Right? Choose a life that brings rest for our souls. Right? And for those of you who aren't following Jesus, you can do all those things, and I guarantee you, you will see a positive impact in your life. But your real next step is not to kind of trust Jesus, but to fully trust Jesus. It's to give your life to him and say, okay, like, I want something different. You promise that you offer these things. Let me see how that plays out in my own life. And if you are ready for that, we want to help you celebrate that decision. And the way that we do that is through baptism. And so I want to encourage you, if you're in that place, to check the baptism box in your digital connection card. We'll follow up, we'll do a phone call this week, talk about what does it mean to choose a life that brings you rest. Easter is just two weeks away, right? We're gonna celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Even more so, we're celebrating the promises that became real when that happened. There is not a better Sunday for you to give your life to Jesus and do a death, burial, and resurrection of your old self to be raised up into your new life than Easter. And so if you are looking for a life that feels less burdened, that brings rest for your souls, you start with Jesus. Eugene Peterson is a pastor and an author, and he wrote a paraphrase of the Bible that's called The Message. Um, and I want to read to you what he, how he paraphrased what we read earlier in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This is what he says. 
He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I don't know about you, but this speaks to my soul. I know what it feels like to be tired and worn out. I know what it feels like to be burned out on religion. I want to recover my life. Like, I want a real rest. I want a life that is full of grace. I want to live freely and lightly. And I think you do too. I think that's why you're here. And that is the life that Jesus offers. That's what following him brings. And so God's way isn't harder. It's just better. Let's pray. God, this week and really every week that we're here, um, God, as, as we read your word, as, as we worship, as we feel challenged, God, as we feel your spirit pushing us, um, really the hardest thing that happens when we walk out these doors is change. God, it's changing something about our life, changing something about our rhythms, changing something about the way that we think about things or think about ourselves or think about you. And so, God, as we sit in that place and, and, and maybe as we feel like we know we should be trusting you more, um, God, that, that we want that life that's free and light, um, God, we know it starts with change. And so, so God, I pray this week uh, we have the boldness and the courage to step into some of that change. But God, as we do that, we, re we remember that as we walk alongside you, it's not that you're outpacing us, it's that you are yoked to us. You are carrying some of that weight with us. You are doing some of that work with us. You are walking alongside us. And so God, I pray that we take those steps forward to trusting your word. But God, while we do that, we don't lose sight that you're walking alongside us as we do it. God, thank you so much that you want us to live a life that is free and light, God, that the burden you give us is not heavier than the burden we put on ourselves, the burden our parents put on us, society puts on us, culture puts on us. But even in that burden, God, you carry it with us. God, thank you so much for who you are. We love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.